<laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Lori McPhee. I help manage the programs here at UC Berkeley's Arts Research Center. And we are so happy to welcome you to this reading and conversation with the legendary Patricia Smith and the world changing Denez Smith. This event is part of ARC's Poetry and the Census Initiative, a two year program made possible by engaging the Census Foundation. Uh, and I'd like to give a huge thanks to them for sponsoring this reading, as well as to Mona Abadir and my colleagues, Julia Brian Wilson, Lauren Pearson, and Lindsay Panner. Uh, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that UC Berkeley occupies the unceded territory of the Ohlone peoples and to pay respectful tribute to this land as their ancestral home. This reading was originally scheduled in person about a week and a half after the pandemic sent us here at Berkeley to work remotely from our homes. And we did not have this technology, which for all of its drawbacks has also allowed voices to be shared more horizontally and broadened the idea of audience. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, I am more grateful to uh, Denez and Patricia for graciously rescheduling and post-election and with the vaccine maybe on the horizon about a week and a half for now, um, um, the circle has closed a little bit for the better. Um, the seeds of this reading were sown maybe six to seven years ago, like so many others. Patricia Swift was one of my mentors and I had um, the great good luck of being introduced by her uh, to Denez Smith's work. Uh, I also had the luck of watching them both at an AWP panel in Seattle, it's my first AWP. Um, the two of them read and not only dissolved me, but all the walls of the room. They bring their whole selves and a truth telling and have pushed the limits in what we write and what can be written about. Uh, and we're thrilled to bring their voices together tonight. Um, before I introduce them, I want to let you know about ARC's final event of the semester, next Wednesday, December 9th at five o'clock Pacific. Our eight fierce and uncompromising 2020 Poetry Fellows will be capping off their year with a celebratory reading featuring work they've created during their fellow Fellowship. Um, the information is on our website, which is arts.berkeley.edu. I'd like to add that one of our poetry fellows, Manat Allah El Atma, is going to be joining us for a short conversation after the readings tonight. Uh, and finally, I want to mention to the audience that questions in the YouTube chat will be sent to me um, to ask in the Q&A portion. I want to carry your voices into this conversation, so please feel free to ask them at any point in the evening, um, and they'll be sent on to me. Uh, so now to our poets. I'm going to keep the bios brief, uh, as I'm sure you know so much of their wonder, uh, and so we can get to their voices. Uh, I'll introduce them now together. Denez will read, followed by Patricia, and then we'll be back for our conversation and questions. So I want to start with two quotes, first by Denez. Black words matter. This world changes when Black knowledge, queer knowledge, women's knowledge come together and do not try to please or replicate the knowledges that have ruined the land. And the second by Patricia speaking the world words of uh, mothers of killed Black boys. I don't believe this saga I've suppressed will ever sound familiar. I am just a stooped and accidental saint, no choice except to strain the limits of my throat. Denez Smith is a black queer pause writer and performer from St. Paul, uh, Minnesota. They are the author of Don't Call Us Dead, which won the Forward Prize for Best Collection and was a finalist uh, for the National Book Award. They also wrote Insert Boy, winner of the Kate Tufts Discovery Award and the Lambda Literary Award for Gay Poetry. Denez's third co collection, Homie, was published by Grey Wolf in January and is possibly one of the best things uh, about 2020. They are the recipient of numerous fellowships, uh, including from the Poetry and McKnight Foundations, as well as the NEA. And their work has been featured widely from BuzzFeed to Best American Poetry. Denez is also the co-host of the fabulous podcast Versus with Franny Choi. Uh, if you have not seen it, please look on the Poetry Foundation website. Um, Patricia Smith is the author of eight critically acclaimed books of poetry. I'll mention a few here. Incendiary Art uh, was the winner of numerous awards, including the 2018 Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award, as well as being a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. 
Should have been Jimmy Savannah, was the winner of the Lenore Marshall Prize from the Academy of American Poets. Blood Dazzler was a National Book Award finalist and Tea House of the Almighty National Poetry Series Award winner. I could go on and on. Her work has appeared widely in Poetry, Paris Review, New York Times. Uh, Patricia is a Guggenheim Fellow, NEA recipient, uh, two-time winner of the Push Cart and a four-time individual champion of the National Poetry Slam. And last but very not least, a most beloved teacher. Um, so with that, we are going to go on and uh, begin with the readings. And I'd like everyone to welcome, please, Dennis Smith. Hey, everybody. Uh, I am so excited to be in my living room. Uh, in front of the, uh, with all y'all, I'm with Patricia, who I love so dearly, um, and who is a teacher of mine as well. And yeah, anytime I get to gather at her feet um, is a good night. All right, I'm gonna read these little poems um, and then we're gonna get out the way. Um, okay. Um, oh, the election's over. I'm not reading that poem again for like a year. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Let's see what else, what else I want to go to. I'm going to Doe Call is Dead. Let's do some poems from here. Um, cool. Uh, I'm going to read from um, the first poem in Don't Call Us Dead, um, Summer Somewhere. Uh, this poem imagines an afterlife that is exclusive um, to Black boys living, uh, or to Black boys and Black men who are mur were murdered by the police or other avatars of white violence. Um, I think. I've been thinking a lot about alternate realities and like other worlds. I've been watching a lot of Rick and Morty. Um, and, I've also, <laughs> <laughs> and I've also just been like in this damn house. And so I've just been like, where else? Um, so I've been thinking about this poem a little bit and what lessons I'm learning from it these days. Um, I'm laughing too much. This poem still makes me cry. All right. Summer somewhere. Somewhere, a sun below Boys brown as rye play the dozens and ball. Jump in the air and stay there. Boys become new moons, gum dark on all sides. Beg bruise blue water to fly. At least tide, at least spit back a father or two. I won't get started. History is what it is. It knows what it did, bad dog, bad boy, bad blood, bad day to be a boy, color of a July well spent. But here, not heaven, not earth, we can't recall our white shirts turn ruby gowns. Here, there's no language for officer or law, no color to call white. If snow fell, it fall black, please don't call us dead call us alive someplace better we say our own names when we pray we go out for sweets and come back sometimes a boy is born right out the sky Drop from a bridge between a bridge between star shine and clay. One boy showed up, pulled behind a truck, a parade for himself in his wet red red train. Years ago, we plucked brothers from branches, peeled their naps from bark. Sometimes a boy walks into his room, then walks out into his new world, still clutching wicked metal. Some boys waited here through their own blood. Doesn't matter how he got here, if we're all here to dance. Grab a boy, spin him around. If he asks for a kiss, kiss him. If he asks where he is, say gone. Do you know what it's like to live on land who loves you back? No need for geography. Now we safe everywhere. Point to wherever you please and call it church, home, or sweet love. Paradise is a world where everything is sanctuary and nothing is a gun. No. Here, if it grows, it knows its place in history. Yesterday, a poplar told me of old forests heavy with fruit I'd call uncle, a, a, a bursting red pulp and set a fire, harvest of dark wind chimes, and after I fell, from its limb, it bandaged me and sat. I, no, 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 no. Um, if, we, if we dream the old world, we wake up, hands up. 
Sometimes we unfuneral a boy who shot another boy to hear and who was once a reaper, we make a brother, a crush, a husband, a duet of sweet remission, say the word. I can make any black boy a savior, make him a flock of ravens. His body bursts into the ebon seraphs. This, our handcrafted religion, we are small gods of redemption. We dance until guilt turns to sweat. We sweat until we flood and drown. Don't fret, we don't die. They can't kill the boy on your shirt again. How old am I? Today, I'm today. I'm old as whatever light touches me. Some nights I'm new as the fire at my feet. Some nights I'm a star, glamorous, ancient, already extinguished. We, sin we citizens of unpopular heaven and loathe attended crucifixions listened. I've accepted what was given to me, be it my name or my ender's verdict. When I was born, I was born a bullseye. I spent my life arguing how I mattered until it didn't matter. Who knew my heaven would be my coffin dead? Is the safest I've ever been. I've never been so alive. There, I drowned back before once. There, I knew how to swim, but couldn't. There, men stood by shore and watched me blue. There, I was a dead fish, the river's prince. There, I had a face and then didn't. There, my mother cried over me open casket, but I wasn't there. I was here by my own water, singing a song I learned somewhere south of somewhere worse. But now, everywhere I am is the center of everything. I must be the Lord of something. What was I before? A boy, a son, a warning, a myth, I whistled. Now I'm the god of whistling. I built my Olympia downstream. All right, um, I'm gonna read a new poem um, that also is about Emma Till, Happy Christmas. Uh, Happy holidays in America. Um, I got asked, to, I got commissioned to write a little poem for this project. And I was given a poem to write about the year, like a decade or a year to write about. Um, and I was a little bit late to the email response. And so I was given 1955, which is a fuck of a year for niggas um, or black people. Um, I don't know who's all on this YouTube um, because it's like the year that Rosa Parks, um, that the, that, that bus lost that bus boycott. Um, it's the year that Emma Till dies. Um, and I think Emma Till sort of weighs so heavy um, in the like collective black conscious all the time. Um, and I definitely in mind, I think in the mind of Don't Call Us Dead as a book too. Um, and I was just thinking about that and thinking about my granddad. Um, and so I came up with this poem. This is the first time I'm reading this anywhere. So new shit. Um, but let's think about it for the last one. All right, brand new poem. Um, never read this out loud. Okay, cool. Um, anything you need to know? Um, Mississippi has cool city names. So like um, where Emmett Till was murdered um, is called Money, Mississippi. My grandparents are from a place called Egypt, Mississippi. That's uh, maybe the only thing you need to know. Sounds weird, but it's poem. All right, 1955. Two hours east of Egypt, over in Money, that boy and his overripe face, river rat, no seed, no amulet. My grandpa, 16 and singing, still small, fear steadied years from his own violence, pulls the name from the radio, feathered and soaking, stunned blue by the current silk trample and keep. What a soft name. You must hum to begin him. Mama's massacred little man made maybe martyr. Mural haunting wallets, a warning tucked between nephews, his face. No face, that face, his. His name wounds time, his face, a knife sinking through centuries, but centuries don't fit in a year or in a boy's guiltless hands. My grandpa, before he was anyone's flinch, stood in the kitchen with crows in his chest. He was no sky, and yet in his hands, a boy, dead enough to be an angel, too drenched to fly. My pa, a sky, stood in wait for the river to drain from wings. Where was your someone when the drowned refused flight? And 
Mamie left his mushy face to wind and flies, flashes and eyes. That year, Rosa utters a coordinated no, and the world takes off as my James takes a train north into another white cold kill, and that name still soggy and refused in his hands and all over all he touches, his daughters, his wife's cheeks, the split hogs, where he is secret and plush, everything wet with it. Listen, this is true. My grandma met him two summers before. Then in his little quartet, he brought her ice cream and laid ditties at her flats. Summer, evil, bright, constant, changes a boy, fills him with a grown terror. I never heard my James's song, not one lonely peep. All right. Um, cool. All right. Um, let's see. Okay. I think I got time for a couple more. Um, <laughs> poems are things that I write. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you have to convince yourself of that. <laughs> I do that. Um, okay. Uh, um, what would feel good to read right now? Um, this one. All right. Um, this is called Self Portrait as a 90s R&B Video. Lately, I've been opening, picture like um, Tony Braxton and um, this is like basically a rip off of a Tamiya video. Um, all right. Lately, I've been opening doors in slow motion and find myself wearing loose white silks in rooms packed with wind machines and dusk. I have a tendency to be sad near windows, thinking of all the problems I have with my man, with his trifling yellow ass. My man is more a concept than anything. At dinner, I watch red pepper soup spill onto his powder blue button down and ask, why don't you love me anymore? I, cry, I sit on the couch with a wine glass full of milk, cry in ways that frame me gorgeous and fuckable. My girls come over and we light his suits to burn our spliffs, buy Gucci heels with his credit cards, then stomp out all his shit. My best friend, to my best bitch tells me I need to get over him, say that he don't even exist, but what she know? I got all this house to walk through, all these gowns to cry on, all these windows to watch the rain, there must be a man in this house who loves me too much to do it well. There's a room in my basement filled with water and gold, and that's it. Water up to my well-managed waist, gold link chains that curl around my ankles like a boa constrictor or the hands of a man around a neck he used to love to bite. I dip my head in, let even my hair get wet and rise out the water, hood, Venus, Aphrodite, ghetto God with iced out ropes draped from my head and arms, covering my nipples and ill na na, just so. I could be a trophy for some award show only niggas know. Every rapper's favorite ex, 1996, given a body and he don't want this. I walk into my foyer because I have a foyer and say, who is she, nigga? I promise the hydrangeas flinch. My man so fake, he don't exist. My girls was right. The suits we lit were mine. My man's all in my head and it's a bad head. Tomorrow, after I run and spend some time studying the mirror, I'll burn this whole shit down. Like left I would, like any good wife. Whatever survives the blaze will be my kingdom. I hope I make it. <laughs> Come on, T. <laughs> I'm glad you were laughing at that one because it's such a silly poem. I can't believe they let me put it in a look. No, okay. it's not silly. It's just on point. That's what it is. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Um, maybe one serious and then one not so serious and then we'll be out. Um, cool, cool. Um, do I really need to? I'm like trying to avoid things that are like no, I I read that sad ass poem at the start, so I ain't gotta read nothing else sad. Um, 
yeah, the world sucks. And I'm like trying to like avoid the poems that like are reminding of that a little bit, but it's impossible. That's what I write about. Um, let's see. Um, do I want to do that one last? Yeah, okay. Um, let's go here. All right. Uh, oh, I haven't read Dinosaurs in the Hood in fucking forever. Let's do that one, sure. All right. <laughs> Here's an oldie but a goodie. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, let's make a movie called Dinosaurs in the Hood. Jurassic Park meets Friday meets The Pursuit of Happiness. There should be a scene where a little black boy is on the bus playing with the toy dinosaur, then looks out the window and sees a T-Rex because there has to be a T-Rex. Duh, nigga. It's a dinosaur movie. What do you think is gonna happen? Um, don't let Tarantino direct this. In his version, the boy plays with a gun, the metaphor being black boys toy with their own lives, the spitting image of his father, the foreshadow to his end. Fuck that. The kid is playing with a plastic triceratops or brontosaurus, and this is his proof of magic or God or Santa. I want a scene where a cop car gets pooped on by a pterodactyl. I want a scene where a corner store, wait, I don't remember the, uh, I want a scene where, what the fuck did you say you want in this scene, Denez? Uh, where a pop card is pooped on by a pterodactyl. I want a scene uh, where the corner store turns into a battleground. Don't let the Wayans brothers, this poem is a little bit dated, um, in this movie. <laughs> I don't want any racist shit about Asian people or overused Latino stereotypes. This is a movie about a neighborhood of royal folks, children of slaves and immigrants and addicts and exiles saving their town from real ass dinosaurs. I don't want some cheesy yet progressive sexy mung hot dude hero with a funny yet strong black girl buddy cop film. This is not a vehicle for Will Smith and Sofia Vergara. I want grandmas on the front porch taking out raptors with the guns they hid in the walls and under mattresses. I want Cecily Tyson to make a speech, possibly two. I want some of those little spitty screamy dinosaur things to go <sighs> I want Viola Davis to save the town in the last scene with a black fist at Afro pick through the last dinosaur's long scale neck, but this can't be a black movie. Nah, this movie can't be dismissed because of its cast or its audience. This movie can't be a metaphor for black people in extinction. This movie can't be about race. This movie can't be about black pain or cause black pain. This movie can't be about a long history of having a long history with hurt. This movie can't be about race. Nobody can say nigga in this movie who can't say it to my face in public. No chicken jokes in this movie, no bullet holes in the heroes and nobody kills the black boy and nobody kills the black boy and nobody kills the black boy for once. Nobody kills that black boy besides. The only reason I want to make this is for the first scene anyway. The little black boy on the bus with his toy dinosaur, his eyes wide and endless, his dreams possible and pulsing. And right there. Cool. All right, all right. Um, I think I got a tad bit more time, so I'm gonna sneak in one last poem. Um, cool. And then we will hear from the magnificent uh, Patricia Smith. Okay. Um, okay. I'm gonna go a tad bit over, but that's fine. We're in the Zoom time. Um, cool. Cool. Um, this is called Acknowledgements. It's for you and your little friends. All right. Um, it's my best friends. I... Acknowledgements. One, you saved me half a bag of skins, the hard parts, my fave, dusted orange but hot. One, you say we can't go to the bar because you're taking your braids out. I come over, we watch Medea while we pull you from you. One, you make us tacos with the shells I like and you don't. One, I get too drunk at a party. You scoop my pizza from the sink with a solo cup. All that red, 
one. You in the morning, bong water grin, wet chin, one. You in the lawless dark, laughing like a room of women laugh at a man who thinks his knowledge is knowledge, one. You, I text you and you say, I was about to text you, bitch, one. You cook pork chops the same way I do. Our families in another city go to the same church, one. You rolling a blunt, holding your son is a mecca, one. You invite me out for drag queens the night I thought to finally. One, you pull over in Mississippi so I can walk a road my grandfather bled on. One, you gave me a stone turtle. It held your palm sit for a week. One, I call your mama, mama. One, you request like a demand. Make me some of that mango cornbread and I cut the fruit, measure the honey. One, you and you and you and you go in on a dildo for my birthday. You name it Drake. You know me. Ah. Okay, so this poem is also dated because I did have a crush on Drake, but he's a kind of a creep now. And so I should probably <laughs> Um, in this poem, um, send Drake to jail. <laughs> I mean, abolish prisons, but until then, send Drake to jail. All right, um, one, a year with you in that dirty house with that cracked out cat was a good year. One, at the function, I feel myself splitting into too many rooms of static. You touch my hand and there I am. One, do you want to be best friends? A box for yes, a box for maybe yes. One, did our grandmothers flee the fields of embers so we could find each other here? Friend, you are the war's gentle consequence. One, I am the prison that turns to rain in your hands. One, you at my door, the night my father left beyond what we know. One, the branches of silence stay heavy with your petal. One, you smell like the milk of whatever beast I am. One, your poop is news, your fart is news, your gross body, my favorite bop. One, you drunk as an uncle, making all kinds of nonsense since I flew it, the language between your words, one. And when we fight, not a ring, but a room with no exit, we spill the blood and bandage the wound, clean cuts with tongues, one. If luck calls your name, we split the pot. If you wither, surely I rot, one. We come, we hate the same people. Say nigga please with the same mouth, one. And before we were messy flesh, I'm sure we were the same dust, one. Everywhere you are is a church and I am the pastor the deacons, the mothers fainting at the altar, one. As long as I am a fact to you, death can do with me what she wants, one. My body, water. Your body, a trail of hands carrying the river to the sea, one. I ink your name into my chest to fasten what is already there, one. You made coming out, coming in from the storm, one. I would love you even if you killed God, one. You, the country I bloody hills for, one. You love me despite the history of my hands, their mangled confession, one God bless you, who screens my nudes, drafts my breakup text, one, you, the drug that knocks the birds from my heart, one, oh, the horrid friends that were just ships harboring me to you, one, and how many times have you loved me without my asking? How often have I loved a thing because you loved it? including me, one, with your ugly ass, one, at the end of the world, let there be you, one, my world. Oof. All right, thank y'all. Um, and up next is my world, my inspiration. Um, I had the privilege of uh, teaching, should have been Jimmy Savannah this year, and is so excited my students, and I'm always so excited to bring her work into the classroom uh, because I get to see um, a view of myself um, from outside of myself. I remember um, being um, in high school the first time I encountered Patricia Smith's oh, work and just God, feeling so right. electrified. Uh, I, I, mean, I mean, you've been the poet of my life, you know, uh, but I think like, um, and I'm so honored um, to know you and to be able to do um, things like this with you, um, but just always to, to encounter your work is to encounter um, genius that one cannot leave um, feeling more possible as a human um, and more encouraged as a poet to go forth and do the impossible. And so the impossible yet tangible, the amazing Patricia Smith. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and as you are 
constantly astounding. I love you so much. I really miss you. And uh, thank you for being one of my most important teachers. Mm -hmm. um, everything, everything you write and do, um, I just pull it in, I take it in, I internalize it. It becomes part of who I am. I love you so much, miss you. Um, and that was fantastic. I have my own little reading of Dinosaurs in the Hood. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. <laughs> and I never fail to, when I hear Aphrodite, I'm like, okay, it's over. <laughs> I'm really proud of that one. Thank you. Yeah, I know. That was that was sweet. That was sweet. Um, I am going to read a poem about thank you, Berkeley, for invite putting us together. Uh, which is always uh it's always magic. It's always a little bit of a miracle, and I'm glad it could happen. Um I'm gonna read a poem about uh black hair because a little girl was sent home because um, somebody poked a finger into her hair and she decked a little boy. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, okay. In its beginning, earth was fractured, frail with coveting and could not wait for us. So flailing in the muscled clutch of grace, we blessed this sullen place. As we were born and born again, in tenements and lush, exuberant savannas, flung from hips of southern silver, lifted into life while mamas shrieked and swore as we were born and born again, emphatic, snared within our thrash and wail, our breath already slowed by blood's incessant question in our chest. Every dazzled witness rose to name us yet again. The world was not prepared. Inside its realm, no one could fathom us. Inside its realm, no one could fathom us. We brazen through their shuttered doors. We huge inside their throats. We necessary, our newborn crown smeared flat with blood, so hot against our little heads. The white mistake was thinking that, once rinsed and blotted dry, the clenched rebellious snarl was simply hair with nothing more to say. They saw instead the way our skin corrals and guzzles the sun, our breathlessness, our legendary hips. They saw what commerce needed them to see, our backs grown wide and measured for the want of work. They missed the hurricane of hair, the springing from a thousand wicked roots. That springing from a thousand wicked roots was just the brash beginning, just the bray of light that hisses warning, do not touch my hair. This vibing wire, these bellowed threads of thundering, no, do not dare to poke a prying finger into dark you do not understand. Our hair is blade when we decide that it should be. The fools who died within its kink would speak of smother if they could. Our hair is not your savior, not your kumbaya, your ticket in. When it began so smashed and sleek with blood, we knew that it had fist. Our hair can't be polite. Once we were slaves, our hair was furious. Once we were slaves, our hair was furious, forever springing loose from plaits and bows, rejecting homemade greases meant to tame the wild and wiry bloom that snapped its bands and leapt alive at every chance. At last, some part of us was running free, like flame that hungers for a sky, like praying fixed on some place we knew heaven was. We sang our songs but didn't move our mouths. We burned to black inside ourselves. With rivers as our mirrors, we began to build a wall between our stolen air and us. We snapped our dresses to our throats, made sure our hair was braided thick against the spit of men. Hair braided thick against the spit of men, we hurtled forth. For years, we mystified the whisper trest, but listened when they said that we were wrong, not white or silk enough, and that we'd never be unless we walked into the fire, succumbing to a hate we'd hoarded for ourselves. Because they loved their blemished daughters, Mama's twisted knobs on cranky ovens conjured flame and made us sit on rusted wobbling kitchen chairs beneath the ironing comb that charred our necks beneath the lie that chewed at scalp and root and we endured that hurt 
forgot the days our chaos crown had bellowed, nap unleashed. Our crown still fought to bellow, nap unleashed, though it was wounded, hammered down with heat and oil that stank of animals and flowers, although we wept while memorizing pale and wispy heads in magazines. We gazed and learned to suffer poisons to correct our ugly, free us from the blunder of ourselves. And as we listened, reaching up to touch a stranger's head, a stranger head, with strands that disappeared us, trapped us in their strangling glamour, we remembered this, that we are people destined to explode. So we exploded toward ourselves again. When we explode, we know ourselves again. We shake our funky liberated heads and raise our voices to the rafters. Do not dare touch these crowns and we are Alabama, Brooklyn, Watts, and we are middle finger lifted toward the seething witnesses to all this joy. And we are Trinidad and Harlem. We are bopping straight into the yesterday we were and straight into the history we've made and straight into tomorrow with our rampant nap so gleefully unchecked, so unrestrained, entwined till we become a single soul, yet none of us the same. A single soul, yet none of us the same. We are the only government we need. Our vivid cocky crowns stunned in their tilt and swirl. They devastate and irritate. They be our gospel, be our calling card. They be our halo, be the way we reach for sky. The crown is ours to snip or die a hundred awkward hues. It's ours to tuck beneath a Sunday hat, a weave to crimp and twist, to scissor down to air, much like a man's. This hair is all our other breath. It's art upon our heads, a glory spill. It's wild, bewildering, and sexy in its snarl. It's neon, razored, locked and knotted, looped and neon, razored, locked and knotted, looped and razored, locked and neon, looped and not the business of just anyone. Our hair is blatantly political, a staunch and blaring tangle, glory in our names, the gospel on our bobbing heads. It's fierce, and yes, still furious, still springing loose from any peril set on silencing its roar. You've underestimated us. You didn't know the muscularity of kink was busily rebirthing us. It taught us all the ways to mouth our names with Serengeti tongues. It's quarrelsome and coiled. It's all the things, but always black and coiled. This hair is all the things, but black and wily goddesses. We've always known the powerfulness of wearing our own sky. The lyric of the scar. We've always known that even though they dared to call us slaves, we never were. If only they had heard the freedom on our heads, the jubilant triumphant wail of all that hair, its rude unbridled verb, they would have left us free to rule our own damn selves, to live our sweet and colored lives. Our hair is throat, is knife against the throat, is song within the throat. It's how we rock and conquer every room. Our hair's the funk, the scorch. Aretha's growl is hair, is funk, is scorch. Aretha gro Aretha's growl is one of just a million ways the tale is told. It's told in gospel hurtling toward the rafters, told in warnings grunted blue and deeper blue by Delta gals. It's told in songs our mamas sang before they threw those pressing combs into the fire. Go on and raise your eyes to where we rise. Go on and hail the royalty we be. Go on, resent the ways we vow to live our souls out loud, but do not touch this air. The black explode, the crowning of it all. Your hands will never know a shelter in this heat so sweetly hellish on our perfect heads. So sweetly hellish on our perfect heads, this hair has known the yesterdays we know, has lived the histories we've lived. Once we were slaves, and then there were the days we sat on plastic kitchen chairs while trying not to hear the sizzling iron comb, its teeth intent on disappearing us. When they were freed, embracing wild, each strand became a fist that pierced the air, a strident voice that sanctified and irritated, each and every one its tiny god. You say, it's only hair, a consequence of blood, a quirk of body. What it is, is life, and even history can't twist that truth. 
Yes, even history can't twist the truth that can't warp the telling. See our hair's the thing that no one else will claim. It makes us like nobody else. It seems there is a world of silk, of blonde and auburn, pinkish skin that coppers under sun. But then there's powerful nappy. There's the feral curl, the everything there is, what black girls have that no one else imagines. Mystery prevails. It just may be the kiss of sun that's braided in the braids, the moon that spits its liquid light in dreaded ropes. The earth was not prepared for what our locks would scream. In its beginning, earth was so fractured, so frail. In its beginning, earth was fractured, frail. Outside its realm, no one could fathom us, our springing from a single wicked root. When we began, our hair was furious and braided thick against the spit of men. Our chaos crown still razzles, nap unleashed, and we explode, always ourselves again, a single soul, yet none of us the same. It's neon, razored, crimped, and knotted, looped, and coiled. It's all the things, but always black. Our hair's the funk, the scorch, Aretha's growl. It's sweetly hellish on our perfect heads. Not even history can twist this truth. No woman wears a crown quite like a queen. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. And um, okay, so this, uh, and I, I didn't put my timer on, but this is a, a two part poem and it just may be the time. Um, there's a, a painting, Madonna del Parto, and it's Madonna with two angels. And the angels are almost carbon copies of each other. It's hard to tell whether they're male or female. Um, but Madonna has this really, she's very pregnant and she has this really come hither glare uh, that sort of stopped me when I saw it. I'd never seen that look in her eyes before. It made me think of maybe the life that she wanted and maybe how frightened she was about what was happening inside her body. So, um, two part poem. One, the angels. We are astonished and teetering in grace. Beneath these bland folds and blessings that stifle, we are men scrubbed clean of cravings and worldly desires, but yet. We are wildly aware of her, her body dumb with impending birth, all that wrong water shifting, all that virgin housing a doomed river. We are born to be slave and adornment, faded as footnote to revelation, tuned to her whimpers and swells. But neither of us has a name, a stern way to walk through this impossible magic. Are we to believe that everything we've ever wanted wallows in this stoic farm girl, sickly and gossamer, speaking in tongues with the middle of her body? In the night, her wailing reaches to somewhere we've never seen. It is a gaping well of grief and something more akin to bone as she rolls onto her back and, through a rip in the roof of the birthing room, curses with her eyes fixed on one pockmarked point in the stars. There is never an answer. The three of us, two harried angel and the harbor for a tempest, sweat inside these overwrought mink walls, waiting for that ripple in the sky to declare itself father, waiting for the definition of our own lives, waiting for a deluge of blood. We are not allowed to help her only to stand at her sides as awkward soldiers, deaf to her need for water and her blue explosions. We are not allowed to help her, only to listen to her mourn for something that is looped within her, already turning to engine, already far beyond the gummy reaches of any mother. We are not allowed to help her. We could only watch as she wakes, bleakly nauseous, and picks at her meals of oblation and air. We are not prepared to help her. We are nothing but flawed cartoons stamped one from the other without hinges at the corners of our mouths and our hearts are imperfectly painted. We scuttle to the edges of the circle as far away as we can, cowering against her sacred rumble while our unblinking eyes learn the thankless art of worship. We are not allowed to covet her, 
to sway to the crashing rhythms of her belly, to hear the thunder of milk descending, or to turn focus to those plump perfumed fingers deciding and undeciding at the hooks of her dress. Once these curtains close, we are paralyzed witness, our hands suited only for the closing and opening of curtains. She will writhe and bite and claw for penance in the dirt. She will bellow as her body becomes a troubled country. When it is over, she will bless us first with names, and those names may tell us what these wings are for. Two, the Madonna. Cradled in his undulating cage, he is already learning to die. I feel him breathe just once each night. It is a music so ragged I pitch awake just to grieve him. I travel my belly with a shaking hand and he is perfectly, frighteningly still. In that way, he prepares and loves and spurns his mother. My sleep out of the wind or sun and away from the con condemnation of real women is fitful. I can't find comfort. I blare with fever, wrench at my halo. My dream is always the same. My womb splintered and spitting, reversing, turning away a stranger. I have never had a child. I have never known another purpose for this body. I do not know what he will do with me when he is done with the world. I have never been this huge and important, judged only for my strength at holding. So I approach these last days as mere vessel, nibbling water, humming against demons, pushing my fingers deep into my swollen feet, keeping him alive. I have never been told that I am precious in my swelter, that my unsteady bulges, scarlet splotched cheeks and tree trunk ankles are instances of glory. The, angle, the angels chant this lie in a ribbon of babble. They haunt and adore me. Their mouths do not move. The angels know more of me than I am. They know that it terrifies me, the thought that he will grow restless and explode from me, forgetting that I am human. They stand unmoving during my questions for the sky and my bone deep weep when the sky has no answer. They watch me go through the motions of being what I never was, rehearsing the come hither, the hooded gaze and sly smile, the measured surrender, a walk that involves my hips. I finger the hooks of my dress as if there was an unveiling to consider, as if there was just a trembling body beneath these blue pleats, not the kingdom come, not the kingdom come, not the salvation of the world. I love how my angels glimpse that sin, my flirt with nothing, the worldly walk I manage before fluid drips downward and does its vile work. They see me just, as, just once as mortal and woman, and their eyes are wide, never blinking, painted to receive and receive. They make me feel as if someone were waiting for me, just for me, and not only for what this body is destined to give and give. That's, thank you, I think that's it. Thank you very much. You're the greatest poet alive. No, maybe. We walked that road together, right? Nah. <laughs> we walking that. We walking that. The Smith, the Smith clan. Nah, I am. I am the Ashanti of poetry. You are the. <laughs> I got my little bops. <laughs> you know. <laughs> we still stand up when that song come on, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> I get my respect that you know they play me at the party. <laughs> I love you, D. You teach me so much, babe. You really do. I love you too. Oh my God. Um, you like that was a I would say right now, I was looking at that photo. Your your poem is better than the picture. Oh, you looked at the, the Yeah. Uh, you yeah. See, you see what I saw, right? You see that, that she's got this kind of mm -hmm. thing going on. And at first I was because I was like, this this poem is more exciting than you said the dull, the dull curtains. And I was like, there is some dull ass curtains for <laughs> The Madonna through. I was like, you right. <laughs> oh, that's so that's so sweet. You look it up. No, yeah, I had to. I love. I mean, expressive stuff. I mean, that that, that always excites me. That was one of. Yeah, my I want. I want to do more of it. I, yeah, I, literally, you did it, and I looked at the painting that's on my wall, and I wrote down like two notes about it. I was like, <laughs> I did. I was like, we're gonna look at you and write a poem tomorrow. <laughs> oh, can I ask another question before Dennis? What is that behind you? 
to this, the, yeah what's that this is it's one of my favorite pieces of art in my house um it is a cross completely made out of tissue paper and toilet paper uh, oh my goodness um, yeah i got it in michigan at a prison art function so yes it was made by an incarcerated artist um oh, it's beautiful when it was turned like that i wasn't sure it looked at first like it might be a um like a rock formation like gems you yeah, know no, and so good. yeah so now that i can see it closely yeah so it's like flowers and stuff like that yeah yeah oh that's beautiful yeah it's my baby um when i dropped out of grad school i rolled 10 hours down 94 with that in my lap because i didn't want to get rid of it was I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, um, we just going to, okay. Yeah, I, you know, I'll, maybe I will pop in um, and just say thank you. And I am humbled and grateful to be sharing the space with you, hear new poems. Um, and I could have listened to you all for, I was going to like holding up a sign going, no, one more. <laughs> you know, let's do more. Um, so before we get started, I also, um, I want to introduce uh, Manat again, uh, Allah El Atma, um, who will be joining us. Uh, Manat is a 2020 Poetry and the Census Fellow. She is uh, an Egyptian Muslim woman, educator, writer, and visual artist. Manat graduated from UC Berkeley with a BA in English Literature and will be pursuing her master's and credential at USC this January, which I just found out. So welcome, Manat. Um, and Manat and I will go back and forth with some questions. Uh, I'm going to start with one. I'm going to toss one out and then hand it over to you all. Um, my first question is that the this year, Poetry Fellows have been exploring the theme of emergency, which again kind of implies the sudden harm and life-threatening violence, extreme circumstances. Um, and embedded within that is the word emergence, which suggests some sort of a rebirth or catalysts or sort of rising from the ruptures. Um, and, you know, we chose this in 2019, not knowing what this year was gonna come about to. So, um, but I see so many, links to this uh, in a potent way to both of your works. Um, and I wanted to pair this with the idea of, of the wall, which of course I learned from Patricia um, and about writing what's beyond it and how the wall moves or that there's another wall back there. And both of your work is incredibly brave. And I'm just wondering in this current time and space and the ongoing multiplicities of emergency where each of you are right now, so I just want like a check-in and what's emerging for you, um, how you're responding either in the work or otherwise mm -hmm. to all these walls. Hmm. Uh, you know, I, I think first the, there was just a lot of clutter. There was, um, there, was, there was teaching. It was trying to get used to the idea of, of teaching. There was other needs that your students had. You know, I mean, for instance, I'm teaching like 36 people I see about seven of them, we are not allowed to ask them to put their cameras on. So you're wondering behind each of those black boxes, you know, what's going on. And I've already got some things from my students who are taking care of uh, younger brothers and sisters who aren't in school, you know, parents who've lost their jobs, things, you know. And um, when, you, when you think about the depth of the stories behind each one of those, it's, it's almost, it's overwhelming, you know, and the idea of, forgetting to take care of yourself because you're seeing the emergency in taking care of others. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I don't know, you know, it's like, I don't know about Dinez. I haven't been able to write really um, to dedicate that time to myself. I used to talk about it, like checking in for a job, like a nine to five mm -hmm. things you had to do. And, and it's, it, it seems kind of fractured now. Uh, because there's so many things to write. There's so many walls, you know, there's, you, you get up to one and it sort of, you know, it splinters and there's 12 more and you don't know what direction, where am I best, uh, where do these words best go, you know? And, and then meanwhile, you know, you haven't bathed in five days and you, you know, and it's like, well, and how do I take care of myself? The, the way I see it, the, the, the thing that's happening right now, and, and, and I told you about this, it's, it's things that are making me come back to take my own temperature. And this is gonna sound 
to people who don't have pets, it's going to sound really good. My dog died, you know, one of my dogs died after nine years and I'd never really had had dogs before and didn't think that it was, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, I just told you, you know, they called and my 91 year old mother has COVID and the big outbreak in her nursing home where between November 30th and now they've got like, you know, 30 cases, just boom, you know, after being safe. So uh, you, you come back to yourself in a strange, and I think everybody's coming back to themselves in a way, you know, we're looking at mortality in a way that we've never looked at it before. And uh, we'll, I think we remember the importance of not handing our own life stories over to anybody else, you know? Um, and I can only, I, I can't do anything for anyone else if I can't maintain my own root, if I can't stay rooted and, and, and have the earth, the soil feed me so that I feel that like I'm in a position of some sort of strength. And so these things that are happening are almost forcing me to turn back toward myself and say, you know, don't, don't kill yourself trying to be everything. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's so many problems to solve, so many directions to go in. And, um, and, and I think by writing, we're sending, um, we're mm -hmm. sending light out to as many corners as we can. Mm -hmm. You know, so getting myself in a position where, you know, I know that's, that's where my root is. It's in writing. So if I can do that, if I can maintain that strength and, and continue to give, hopefully give other people the, um, the knowledge that they too are in charge of their own stories. You know, we have to figure out where we stand in this before we can reach out uh, to others, I think. Hmm. Oof, that was a, thank you for all that honesty. I think um, I've been feeling, I've, I've been like trying to fight the feeling of feeling bad that I feel weird as a writer and as an artist right now. Um, like I did feel like I found, I found little pockets of like inspiration here and there. I guess prose has been a little bit easier for my brain in these times. Um, in order, especially to write about like the emergencies of the time. Um, like I was saying in the read, I'm like, the world is like, it's not that the world has never not been um, the world um, and, <laughs> you know, but it's just like, uh, but I think the the slow down pace in which to stare at it <laughs> um, and consider it. Um, and I think the lack of like other types of interaction, like I really miss, um, it, my poetry misses strangers, you know, I realized like how much of oh, like, wow. Um, how much of my work came from like, just like moving throughout the world whether I was traveling around or just in the city and just like looking at somebody else and thinking about a thing, right? Noticing uh, how somebody else triggers memory for you or how somebody else, you know, just the image of someone on a corner doing something strange, you know? Um, so many of those inspire poems for me. And so um, I think my writing just misses other people and the triggers that we get from one another. Um, and so a lot, a lot of my writing when it has come has either been like way like less narrative and recognizing as like having like being me or like having a self um, or it's like super memory based. Um, it has been interesting like being um, very, very local um, this year um, where I was normally like hopping and bopping around a little bit more. I've been like in Minneapolis um, and just driving these same routes over and over again. And so that's been triggering some stuff slowly but surely and I'm trying to just like relish when I do um, feel called to make art um, and also recognize that when I don't that my energy is going elsewhere these days whether that's self-care community care family care um, or just staying fucking sane. <laughs> you know I don't know um, and trying to also feel like trying to also push away um, this sort of charge to be productive in this time in a way right like um, especially for artists, I feel like a lot of folks are like, oh, wow, like we're, we all basically get a residency, you know, this is <laughs> um, a very, very long one and we just get right. Um, you know, there are folks who will walk out of the pandemic um, with like, you know, like 80 books. Um, and there will, <laughs> <laughs> there will, you know, some people are just at home typing their asses yeah. off. Yeah, uh, <laughs> sounds lighter, you know. <laughs> hey, you know I'm, like, I'm real proud for y'all, you know. Um, 
And I think for some of us, you know, I think it's okay if it's a slower period. I also have to remember that so much of mm -hmm. uh, the artist's life is not just about um, output, but about input and listening and watching and paying attention. Um, and so I've also been trying to like relish just in like noticing and note taking and stuff like that too, um, as a way to, as a way to like, um, just be kind to, I guess, my future artistic self and say like, okay, um, mm -hmm. if maybe, you know, the like urgencies of the world <laughs> make it or, um, you know, whether those be personal or, you know, otherwise, uh, personal, global, governmental, right, everything, um, if those feel like they are calling my energy elsewhere, then um, what are little things that I can do to like make sure that I'm cataloging um, like my thoughts within that. So that way when I do feel more settled, I can come back to it. Um, and that's been like, I think like, I used to sort of, I think in a very like youngish way, like sort of think like you always had to be writing poems. And that's what people were saying, like you should always be writing. So I, my ass was always writing. And now it's, you know, it's a little bit more settled. It's like, okay, like I can, lean into that writing and like sometimes when I come down to write the poem I'm like cool I haven't written in a while but I have been watching you know and I have been paying attention um and so then coming back and like sitting down at the space and like um being able to have time for poems when that might happen so that's how I'm doing an emergency yeah <laughs> it sucks it's but you know I think um yeah you know take care of yourself as you wait through it and just like you know still feed it a little bit but don't feel bad I don't know if that was a advice type of question, but I'm I need to give my own damn self some advice. No, it was just to <laughs> check in for with you all just first, just to see where you're doing. And again, thank you for being so vulnerable and honest. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think so many of us are feeling that fracturing and so mm -hmm. and, and that loss and the new negotiation and so much has been going on this year that it's just um some level of craziness. So um but not yeah, um so your point, uh, Dennis, made me think about the flonu. The stranger is just like um, someone who is of the crowd, but also apart from the crowd. Um, so your observations of the world that you live in, the world that you inhabit, um, now you inhabit like the world, but in your own kind of space and having to create um, a world within a world. And it's kind of almost, it's a long pause, uh, or it seems like it. Um, and Patricia, Patricia, your um, your reflections reminded me of a particular line from Denez coming out is like it, you, you coming out to you is coming in, um, and in the, just us talking about this reminded me about um, your keynote speech, uh, keeping the second throat. It was um, at near near the end of it. You uh, said that the you you said I don't care that you've misspelled the word this word or that you're using double negatives. Um, what matters is the power that flows through you when you pick up a pen, and you can take any story, even stories that wear you on your nerves and sag your shoulders. You can take those stories and you can turn them to triumph. And then at the end, you say, and they wait. They wait for you. They wait for me. Um, and that made me think a lot about this. And just for you, Mr. Dinez and uh, Patricia, uh, Patricia, what would you, what would you um, how would you reflect on the role of the imagination in the creation of your work? Um, because so much of your, your poetry, both of your poetry, it's so, it's like a prayer. It's so visceral and almost tangible, yet takes it back. It goes, it takes its place otherworldly, extraordinary, and it just makes its own, um, has its own setting. Uh, and so I, I, I wanted to pose the question of that, mm -hmm. the role of the imagination for you. I think imagination for me, um, for me, I'm thinking, so before we started um, this, like in the preamble, we were having a little discussion about um, um, the cinematic quality of poetry, right? Um, how I can sometimes feel like the film lens 
Uh, and for me, I think it relates a lot to imagination um, when I think about that, what it does. Cause um, maybe maybe even as an only child, like, <laughs> I feel very tied to my imagination and like how um, you do use it to like invent um, the world on top of your world, right? And I think that is maybe my like first, like when I think about what, how kids use it, um, it is to like layer the impossible on top of what is already tangible. Um, and so it is kids looking around their living room and saying the floor is lava, you know, and like being able to see that fucking lava. Um, and I think poems are kind of a similar thing for me and how they use the imagination. Um, like I always say that I'm really bad at metaphor and that's not true, but it's because I don't often like think about metaphors when I'm writing them. When I'm writing the poem, I'm just trying to find what's true. And that can be true to the emotion. And that can also be true to the image. Um, and to me, that's that cinematic nature, right? Where we talk about like how, um, about CGI, um, like, you know, science fiction uh, filmmakers get to say, what do we need to make possible here, right? What do we need to see? And I think that's what happens with the poem for me as well when I think about imagination. It's like, okay, I have this scene with um, my grandparents or I have this scene with me and a lover what needs to happen here to be true. And maybe that thing that needs to happen is real. And maybe that thing that needs to happen is rhythm. Or maybe that thing that needs to happen is in the image, is in the metaphor, is in sort of the impossible that I can make real, um, however briefly in the poem. Um, and so that's where I think where I come into imagination is like, okay, how do you, um, from any given moment within the poem, make the next step and whether that uh you know take the next step in whatever world that may be mm -hmm. uh, and to me that requires imagination to think about like okay where am i what needs to be eliminated how what can be created here um i also think about imagination to um for me i don't know why but it's like pulling close to like the world like the word engine for me right now this is very weird and woo woo um but i'm thinking about imagination and i'm thinking about how what am i trying to say Denez? um i guess i'm saying i think it i think it is a source of like how to work through something whether that be personal whether that be in the image in the poem even in the world like i think we approach um social problems with a sense of imagination and that's how we get it right like um i think i think uh prison abolition is is it takes imagination it takes imagination to say defund the police right um and because you can't just say it right you actually have like the imagination that comes this is what that looks like you know to dream the possible world on top of the lived world um and so i yeah i think it i think it's just like it's the most necessary thing I think to writing, you know, especially for fiction, for poetry, for anything that's like a little bit beyond the news. And even the news, we the news is the news because it was out of the normal, right? Like the, you don't watch it every night so they can tell you like the same shit happened. They'd be like, this was the weird shit today. Um, and <laughs> I think that is like the same spirit that we can bring to poetry is like the, the imaginative, the what is possible. Um, I don't think we should, you know, and I'm, there's an argument in here, right? Poetry can be used to like calm and distill and really capture. Um, but I think um, poetry for me, a lot of the times is like activism. It's about looking at the world and seeing what could be, where it could go, um, what maybe we've missed. And I think that requires imagination. Mm. Denez, you know each other. I am. Oh my God. Kind of, you know, a black story. You know, my daddy got 57 kids. <laughs> my mom's only. <laughs> me too. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Same story too. Somebody come up and say, I'm your sister. It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I know those stories. Yeah. Um, what, when I was growing up, uh, it was very important to me to be able to lift myself out of where I was. Mm -hmm. And that was a fault. I mean, you know, later on, Gwilyn Brooks said, take a good look about, you know, where you are, you know, listen to the voices of the people who surround you. There's, that's where your story is. Your story is not out there where you're looking. But, um, you know, I had, a, I had a mother who was constantly like, you know, pinching my nose when I was mm -hmm. watching television and telling me that I was too dark. So I was trying to figure out how do I get out of this? How do I figure this out. 
Uh, so I would just, I would write just reams and reams of, um, you know, the wire rim notebooks and stuff. And I would write the stories, these continuing stories of this white girl. Her name was Erica. She had black hair and blue eyes, which is what I thought was the best combination at the time. I didn't like blondes. And she was the, um, she was the homecoming queen. She was the head cheerleader. She was the class president. She had six brothers, which I thought was the best thing. Her mother was a doctor. Her father was a lawyer. And it was the continuing adventures of Erica Donovan. Hmm. Erica Donovan. Today, we're going to have cheerleading tryouts. Today, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. You know. So the idea of, of crafting the, the reality that you need at any particular time has, you know, has always been something, you know, I mean, you could just look at television when I was growing up and nobody looked like I did. So you, you, you're constantly thinking, how do I get from where I sit into that place right there? And that had to be imagined, you know, you had to imagine yourself there. There was no other way there. Uh, and something that uh, Denez said, it just made me think about, you know, okay, everything's awful. Nobody wants to nobody wants to read our dice little poems. Nobody wants to read about another black, you know, another dead black man. They don't you just don't don't, you know, it's like, oh. So looking for ways to to approach those stories and get into those stories. Uh so you know that, you know, dinosaurs in the hood, it's not about that. It's funny what you said about metaphors too. I read poems that have gorgeous metaphors and I just go. Why can't I do that? Why can't I carry a metaphor for a whole poem? Why can't I, you know, where two days later you go, oh, now I get it now, you know. I, I can't, I, I don't feel like I'm very good at that at all, but I think after a while, uh, you don't really know that's what you're doing because you're looking at so many ways to tell stories and ways to enter stories that everyone's telling. Hmm. You know, you you run to, when you run to the keyboard. Eight hundred other people are running to the keyboard with the same story. They've seen the same thing on television. They've heard the same thing. They, you know, uh, they're in the midst of the same disaster or whatever. And so, what's going to make yours different is mm -hmm. the level of imagination that you can bring to draw the reader in, at mm -hmm. least to get them to enter a story that they really please don't feel like entering. You know. And so I, I think, and I don't think of it quite as imagination, but that, that has to be what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that um, poets should be going crazy all the time. We step out of the house and things just hit us, you know, just like, mm -hmm. you know, Danette said, oh, Patricia did the poem and then I saw this thing and I just started, you know, you, that never ends. That just doesn't end. You hear a snippet of conversation, you know, you see somebody's hat on this way instead of this way. And it starts, you know, that's what, you know, when we're talking about strangers, I miss being out in the world that way where all that is available to you, you know. Uh, but we now have to really kind of live with ourselves and see how much of this stuff we've been doing is real. Hmm. You know, anybody can bounce off of a, a, a prompt or something like that, you know, but, um, and I guess it, it's part of it is like imagination being taken away in a way, hmm. you know, uh, we don't have as much input, we don't have, you know, and so we're working a lot closer to ourselves, but I don't think imagination ever leaves because when you decide, when you sit down to write a poem, um, you've got to enter it in a way that's unique to you. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I think that they can put 30 poems down on a, on a table with no names on them and you'd be able to, to pick out certain poets. Not because they do the same thing all the time, but it's because their imagination works a certain way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you say, okay, this has to be this person, this has to be this person. Um, yeah, that's all I'm gonna say. Next question. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll build on that um, a little bit. I had a question um, from, from imagination to um, maybe revelation. Uh, and in both of your works, you honor the dead um, while also still 
embodying and protecting folks who are still here. And it seems to have to do with naming um, friends and Matil family. Um, and, and your poems are both alive in their grief and rage, you know, and talking about genocide and enslavement and police brutality and, you know, the way white America terrorizes black bodies and uh, grieving mothers and suicide, the, you know, the, the breadth over, you know, the, the work that you do. And yet somehow they are also still alive in their, a kind of joy. I don't know if it's just the joy in being spoken or claimed, but also this tenderness and vulnerability. And I wondered if you could talk a bit about how you find that balance um, and maybe what toll that witnessing might, might take on you. Mm. Mm. <laughs> you know, I don't, hmm. Um, I think the balance comes, because I think for one, um, both when it's personal, the grieving, and also when it's more, let's say, communal um, or um, sort of like the the national or the sweeping grief that comes with like the death of uh, Emmett Till or Trayvon Martin or something like that. Um, I think in all the situations, you're 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 really careful. Um, one, I think it, it, it's a cautious writing that you do that type of elegy because you do have to respect the dead, but I think you don't want to like re-kill or, or present um, violence to the dead in a way. But I don't know if that's always true. Um, that like, that, that, you know, I feel like my part of my mission has been to like build poems that can like say the truth, but still be at least for a moment tender or something like that for um, the folks maybe who can see themselves or the people within it. Um, but there's reasons to go in the other direction too. Like I think um, I'm thinking about Patricia's poem. Patricia, what's the long one called? Um, the is uh, with all, like the oops, I had an accident. Oops, I had an accident. Like oh, um, uh, sagas of the accidental saint. Yes. Um, so like that one, right? Like I think is a poem where, like I think you are overloaded with a particular kind of like violence and play. You know, in, in, for a very useful way. You know, I think. Like I've never heard you read that poem, and I like am not weeping by like the third minute. Um, and I think and like it was. I think I think I was pushed by the first couple of times I read that because I was like, "Whoa, why are we making folks like cry like this?" Like in the midst of my tears, I'm like, "Why are we using this?" And I think there is sort of a usefulness um, both in like deep grief and unforgiving grief and violent grief as there is to maybe the like alive and at times tender elegy that I think you're sort of pointing to. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't think, I don't know what I'm saying in there, but I think that poem was maybe, I'm just thinking about that poem was one for me um, that I think started to embrace questions of like, what does it mean to make an audience hurt um, on purpose? And I think it was a question that I shied away from for a long time, or not shied away from, because uh, I think I have poems, like I, even my own poems, like I was just like, ooh, like I stopped doing Dear White America um, in front of like majority black audiences. Like if I got there and it looked like mostly Negroes, it was like, nope, not doing this one tonight, um, just because I don't need us to like hurt in that way. But then I was also making other choices when I showed up to like a majority white audience to be like, I'm gonna make you motherfuckers cry tonight. Uh, <laughs> you know? And so it's just like, this is question of like, what do you put an audience through? And I think the first time you answer that is when you're writing the poem. And it's almost like, what am I gonna put these people in the poem through? Um, and then that also is like, what am I gonna take these people who are receiving it through too? Mm -hmm. And it's a very hard choice, I think, when you decide like, I'm gonna make these people in these poems go through some terrible shit. Uh, you know, this poem is gonna be difficult and you really battering on the poet too. And so I think it's about using your own gaze and I think about doing that more violent work with purpose because um, I think it can also feel gratuitous um, in the wrong hands and I think there's no real way to do that besides your own meter and of course we're all going to look at each other's work and think different things about it um, but um, you know like I don't I never want to make somebody like cringe in a poem but I am down to make somebody like wince you know <laughs> like those are two different feelings right like and I think that's what like 
that poem of Patricia is like made me think about like it's not a poem where I cringe, but it is a poem where I feel pain. Um, and I think pain can be often useful. Um, and off, also, you know, I think, yeah, in the grief, but also, yeah, the tenderness too. Um, I think I'm done talking. I don't know what the fuck else I'm saying. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's so good. No, it, was, it, was, it was really, when, when, you, when you started talking about the differences in the audiences, I mean, sometimes it's like you want to say, okay, could all the black people just take a break for a second? <laughs> you, you know, y'all, you know, really, y'all know this story. Y'all, you know, y'all live this story. Right, y'all plug your oh, ears, like things I'm yeah, happy with we'll, now. We'll, have, <laughs> we'll call you back in when this is over. This is nothing you don't know. And yes, why should I make you live through this again? You know, um, and and one of the one of the reasons I was I was trying to be careful to use names that um, some names that didn't come that don't come up in the news mm -hmm. uh, because I I I really want people to feel the unrelenting drumbeat of it. That when it's videoed, you see it, you know, something happens, you see the news. So many times it's not videoed. So many times someone dies and you, you know, uh, so it's like, oh, I never heard that before. I never heard that before. I never heard that before. And, and I think what you're doing is you're, you're trying to give your audience, you don't, you don't want to give them a chance to turn away from it, but I can't pick and choose the audience. You know, I mean, I used to do early on, just off of the slam, I used to do black poems for black audiences and then other, whatever that was. And I go, why am I reading a poem about being in Paris to white people? Why am I doing, <laughs> <laughs> why, you know, what happened? What was the click in my head that make me that made me think that was the place to read that. But if I'm reading, you know, a bid poem, I'm over here, right? Yeah. It, it does, it's not supposed to work that way, but mm -hmm. we give too many people too many chances to turn away from what they should be seeing. Mm -hmm. So when we have a captive audience, oh, so you came because you heard, you know, dinosaurs in the hood, or you came because you heard skinhead, or you came, okay, sit down, you know, let me tell you what else is going on, you know, um, and, and, you know, it's not like you're taking it on and say, it's my job to educate white folks or anything it's some black folks that need to hear too you know um but all of us we're always looking for the next thing you know it's like mm -hmm. yeah that was a real tragedy but please what else is going on you know mm -hmm. and 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 to just push somebody's face down and say no stay here mm -hmm. stay here you you will not be able to get out of this space without your mind being changed about something or your willingness to do something, you know. Um, the idea that, um, you know, like when I wrote Incendiary Art, my, a couple of my readers were like, you know, I, I couldn't read it all the way through. I had to put it down and then pick it back up. And can you put something like neutral in here to give us a breath? And that's the problem. Mm. It, that's the problem. It's like, what, why do you need a breath? You know, I mean, this mm. is like, this is what we're living in, you know? Mm. So uh, with the inability to pick and choose the audience, uh, you, you kind of have to decide and, and no, it's not, Oh, I'm going to make you cry. I mean, that's that, that may or may not be a response to something, but um, mm. I, I, I want you to live what so many black folks see as a normal life, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and then what does that say about that life that you cry? You know, what does it say about that life that I might, I might be in front of a black audience and they, some cry and some don't, or some have to leave the room or some have to, you know, uh, I, I guess there's nothing we shouldn't be And I guess this this is probably true for Dennis too. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of reasons people come into the room. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the whole thing. You know that, uh, and I think Dennis, you you posted something on Twitter about uh, the spoken word, and I write too. You know, I write poems too. You know, but sometimes that's the big hook that gets people in. You know, mm -hmm. I'm gonna come. He might do that. She might do that. You know, and. Um, 
And so it's a, it's like a really unique opportunity. You have, a, you have a huge audience. They're there for a lot of different reasons. But the idea that poetry has moved from recreational exercise and entertainment to necessity hmm. has to be something that you can do in that space now. You took the thought out of my mouth because I was literally sitting over here thinking about, okay, what is really the purpose of a poetry reading, right? Um, <laughs> is what you're talking about, right? Because I think it can be really easy. I think I switched into it too, where I think can approach it from an entertainment mindset, you know? And yeah. it's like, okay, well, you know, um, especially, you know, given whatever the vibe is, you know, every reading is different. And there's some where you can come and you feel like, okay, this is some space. We could say some shit here. And there's some times where you feel like, yeah, I'm just here to like, give them a 20 minutes of some poems you know and then we'll all have some wine and whatever you know so like you kind of don't know what sort of things you're like opening like portals you're opening into like the spirit and the world right because that can because it can be such a non-entertainment event right you know like you can really I've been to poetry readings where I've left transformed where I've left mm -hmm. angry you know where I've left ready to fuck some shit up you know um and so I guess like, yeah, it's really, I, I appreciate your thoughts because it's really making me reinterrogate like why we hold that space. And it's maybe at its least productive when it's for poetry as entertainment. Cause like, um, you know, and like, that's not to say like we can't come and laugh and it can't be entertainment, but um, yeah, when we really like challenge folks to, uh, I don't know, it's like we take the Volta out of the poem and try to put it within the people that our experience in the poetry, right? It's like, how do I present you something that leaves transform? I think there are poets who make me do that. I think about you. I think about shit every time I see Avery, our young perform. There are like just folks who, you know, yeah. rip you out of that comfort of entertainment and then say, mm -hmm. no, this is what the fuck we're here for. Um, yeah, that's actually a, a nice challenge for myself to like, you know, I think I read the shit out some poems, but I can, I can go, I can stop, stop being less nice and entertaining. -y. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's okay. It's okay. So, and you're right. No, you're, no, I know. No, I'm not you're saying. Never, you're coming from an audience. Places, you know, but I yeah. Think, yeah. Like, um, it's just nice. It, like in this conversation, I'm just like thinking like, you know, what does it mean to like, you know, like, cause I, I imagine that was a difficult book to probably tour as well personally, but also like, you know, like um, you're not giving people no reprieve, right? And so what is it like to like, um, maybe this is a question like, um, I guess what did, no, 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 this is a question. This is not an episode of Versus. I'm a <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm just thinking all types of shit now. We can get, keep on going forward. <laughs> I'm just, I'm in my head. <laughs> Uh, well, let's see. Gosh, we are actually about, we have like two minutes left. Um, I was going to, to pass this over to Manat for one more question, but I think we might have to sign off here, um, sadly. Uh, but I want to say- That's what happens when you get the Smiths together. We can't- yeah, That's the best part of getting the Smiths together. That's, that's how that works out. We're both extroverts. We're both only children. We will we'll, we'll just talk. <laughs> <laughs> we'll fill your time. Uh, so, so many more questions that could be asked, everything from wondering what's next for both of you and um, just wanting to wish you both the best as we turn the clock over towards 2021. Uh, so gracious of you to spend your time here with us tonight. It's I want fun. to- This is great. So good to see you. Uh, Manat, lovely. Thank you so much for being here. Patricia, thank you so much. Danette, You're welcome, thank you. love. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank again the Engaging the Census Foundation uh, for their support. And again, my, my lovely colleagues at ARC. Um, and a reminder that again, next week, we're going to have one more event, which is the wonderful poetry reading. And you will hear Manat's voice. Uh, so next Wednesday at 5 o'clock Pacific, please join us. Um, and with that, I guess I'll sign off. Uh, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for being here. Bye. Bye, mm. Bye Dines. Bye, Bye. <laughs> Bye, bye, Gwendol, wherever you may be.